This is Charlene Harris, author of the Suki Stackhouse novels, and you are listening to Too Much Scrolling. I'll see you in the future. Scrolling for October 26, 2021. I'm Steve Foder. I'm Spooky Chip Asenflow. And I'm Pam Vador. Hey, Pam's here. It's, it must be thinking about literature week here on Too Much Scrolling. Just in time for Halloween with Spooky Chip Hessenflow and and proper Pam Bador. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing, Pam? I'm doing great. It's great to be back with you guys. How have you been? Oh, everything's fine. Don't worry. Don't worry. Everything's fine. We'll get through this. <laughs> There's ghosts, goblins, vampires, and werewolves everywhere. <laughs> and sandworms. <laughs> Film at 11. Brings us to our film at 11, our movie of the week, Chip. You got a chance somehow this weekend to see the new version of Dune. Did you go to a movie theater to see Dune? I did not go to the movie theater to see Dune because Warner Brothers at the beginning of the year stated that all of their films would be released through HBO Max. So they released this film one day early on Thursday, last Thursday, and I sat down and I said, I'm going to watch this. I need to review a a film. So give me your first impression of Dune. We talked about this last week. You haven't read the book. You did not see the 1984 version. How did you like the 2021 version of Dune? All right, so that is the first thing you should know. I have not read the Dune series. So I know this this is book series is highly regarded and it is truly science fantasy this film should it is very good in the sense that it it accomplishes what it set out to accomplish to basically create the universe visually and show a movie based on this book the challenge i have with this film is that if you said to me chip Can you hum the Star Wars theme? Can you hum the Harry Potter theme? Can you hum the Lord of the Rings theme? Movies that this book is trying to capture that type of of, um, zeitgeist. There, There isn't. The music in this film really, I think, suffers because there isn't a a, uh, a theme that Mm. we, we, it's, is distinguishable that you go, oh yes, this is Dune music. So when the pops come around and you're sitting, you know, during your 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 holiday performances and they're going to play the Star Wars theme and then they're going to play the Doom theme, yeah, I don't really think you're going to find one that you're going to be able to to pull out there. Hmm. I, I I think that the story in general is more grown up than watching Harry Potter or watching Star Wars. Once again films that I think that would be what this film franchise is trying to attract. This is truly much more um, science fiction, science fantasy type of uh, stuff that is for aimed a little more um, cerebral. And uh, I think that this film suffers from just not having that hero's journey that we're going to want to see that is um, going to play out. We, we, we do have a Luke Skywalker or a Harry Potter. It's just not, it's just not the same thing. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot here. There's a second part to it. I ultimately feel that this film would benefit from much more of a series approach, maybe like game of Thrones as opposed to um, using this as a, as a film franchise. And I, I just, I, I think that if I had to rate it, I would say 60 out of 100. This is very good. If you're a person who, who has read Dune, who likes Dune, I think you're going to find a lot here. If you're a person who is casual with your your science fiction or science fantasy, I think that that you could find this confusing. There's the jumping from world to world, maybe 
some of the challenges that Star Wars Episode One had to. I enjoyed it. I did not think this was a great film. Some of the reviews that I've read talk about the visuals, the the scale of this enormity of this world building that Frank Herbert did in the 1965 novel, that some of that is glorious in its visual, but how that applies to the the thrill of the storytelling is what I've been reading as the, the problem with this. Right, so I'll go back to scale on this too because the the ships are massive massive ships the enormity of the the buildings and i mean very similar i'm going to go back to star wars every room is just this it's like a football field and everything so once again there's there's some real challenges in scale even though there is a scale i'm assuming to the book and to how things are going but Planes don't have to be that big that a single passenger has. I, I just look at the challenges of, of building that type of civilization. Yeah, there's there's Tatooine. They're on Tatooine, Steve. Why, why? Tatooine with sandworms, thank you very much. I hate sandworms. Oh, sorry. That's Beetlejuice, not Dune. <laughs> <laughs> there is sort of a Tatooine and a Beetlejuice uh, feel to it. And there, what's, what's beautiful is that there are all these actors that you immediately would say, oh, that's Drax. Ah, oh, yes, that's the guy from uh, Game of Thrones. Oh yes, you know we've we've become very British in the in the sense that you've seen these actors in so many things. <laughs> we've become very British. There are only eighteen actors that that are in sci-fi and fantasy movies. <laughs> That's very British of us. <laughs> <laughs> Pam, have you read Dune? I have, and I completely agree with Chip that I would have pictured it much more as a TV series than as a movie. I haven't seen the movie yet. And I also didn't see the one from the eighties. Um, so I'm just trying to picture which, which part of Dune would they even try to represent? So um, I'm looking forward to it, but I suspect Chip that you've probably hit this review, you know, the way, the same way I will. Chip, if you were to place a bet, do you think that part two will happen after the premiere of this part one? Yeah, I would be surprised if they didn't film it together. Oh. You know, kind of, kind of like uh, Lord of the Rings. You know, where they were continuously filming. Um, if you're going to take on a project like this, we're at a time where you know these types of, of films can be made like this. I, I, I just, I, I think that we've been spoiled by watching series on Netflix. Mm -hmm. That this series right here should have been a i don't know just have yeah. seasons of it and yeah. just put it all together my challenge is is that we've consumed so much material that we can get kind of snooty with this and that's really too bad on one level because this is a very capable film one of the challenges we have with a lot of the current films out there is they're too children like I, I, that's not a great way of i could re re rewrite my word on there but they're they're aimed at too many children's characters this is not children's characters mm -hmm. this is a more of a grown-up type of story but at the same time i mean you start getting your audience smaller and smaller and smaller very similar to disney's experience with uh, john carter uh from mars where um if you remember neil gaiman the the um the Batman illustrator and the commercial artist who basically said, if you want more fantasy films, you're going to have to go out and see John Carter. Uh, and John Carter flopped. And I have a feeling that Dune, even if we were not in COVID times would have underperformed. And th this is definitely a divisive kind of title. There's, there's some people who love Dune, all of the iterations from 1965 on, and some people that see it as kind of a, a boring story about trade negotiations. I have not read it. I have not seen this. I, I've read all the reviews, and I think I might not watch Dune which is surprising to me to say out loud. But it sounds like they were aiming towards my 
love of science fiction and and ships and space travel and and then trade negotiations really ruined episode one of Star Wars for me. Thank you. No no trade negotiations necessary. But you you absolutely should watch this, Dave. This is okay. this is your genre. Right. Um, I, yeah, you can, it's two hours of your life. Two and a half. Two and a half hour long movie, and I think I, I think you're right. If they had made it into a three hour epic episodic story instead of a two and a half hour one feature film, they might have been better off. Well, I, I I would go even further than that. They could have taken this movie and made it into maybe three seasons because the challenge is is we spend so little time we're jumping around from place to place hmm. that. I do think you can get lost in, in some of it. All right. All right. There you go. Opening this week, we've got some interesting movies. The first one is called Last Night in Soho. Can you describe this movie in a simple sentence, Chip? Sure. The, the first simple sentence I would say is Edgar Wright. It's an Edgar Wright film. Just go see it. That's it. There you go. The end. The, the the trailer on this one, there's time travel involved where this young lady travels to the 1960s. There's a surreal element to this where she is in the body of a different person in the 1960s. There's a horror element. And then Matt Smith shows up. That, okay, the end. There's Matt Smith and it's Edgar Wright. <laughs> so it's an Edgar Wright film. This is the, the film that if I was going to the theater this week, this is the one I would watch. But you know what, Steve? We also have a Justine Bateman film that, that comes up this week also. Yeah, Justine Bateman, the actress from Family Ties, is now a writer and a director. This is her directorial debut. It's called Violet. And boy, this looks like a deep dive into fear-based decision-making. Yeah, it looks very interesting. It stars Olivia Mom. This looks interesting. Steve, there's a Chicago film that's coming up. Yeah, this one's called Later Days, a very independent-looking film about a group of friends that uh, throw an 80s-themed surprise party, and uh, hilarity ensues. Yeah, Dad uh, and Mom. Mom's working. Dad says, hey, Mom's birthday's coming up. Let's throw her a birthday party, and let's revisit a 1980s prom. This looks very funny. It's certainly very independent, and I'm sure uh -huh. it's going to be very hit and miss, but hey, it's out there. Yep. There's an animated film called The Spine of Night. This one looks so much like Heavy Metal, that movie from 1981 to me, Chip. It's got a star uh, studded cast. It's got Patton Oswalt in this, Steve. But okay. this is animation, and Steve, that's not the only animation coming up this week. Yeah, we've got a new cartoon from Star Trek premiering on Paramount+. Plus. Star Trek Prodigy, another all-star cast. This one is a children's version of Star Trek. This is a group of teenagers who steal a derelict Starfleet vessel, and we get a hologram of Kate Mulgrew as Admiral Janeway. We get a Robert Beltran. Jason Alexander has a voice in this one, along with a, a whole bunch of other actors i look forward to star trek prodigy and steve's gonna be very very happy this week because he's been waiting a long time for something that's coming up right now <laughs> oh happy halloween everyone i've got a present for everyone for halloween on sunday halloween doctor who is coming back to television everyone doctor who flux is the story that's being told it is a six week season of Doctor Who. It's six weeks long. It is one story. It starts on Halloween with a Halloween episode, Doctor Who's first Halloween episode. There's going to be the six episodes followed by three specials, and then Jodie Whittaker will regenerate, and Chris Chibnall will also leave the show. He'll regenerate into Russell T. Davies. <laughs> so let me clarify. Are they releasing an episode a week? Yes, this All is right. a weekly show, six weeks, one story, six weeks long. I and where is that streaming? This. this is BBC America is where you'll find it in this country, and it's on the BBC in Britain. So we can we can find this. I think HBO Max now has uh, some ownership over Doctor Who. They've got all the episodes from 2005 on, so we might be able to find it on HBO Max this week as well. 
our book it our book of the week the reason pam is here is we have our spooky halloween read that we've been talking about for weeks and weeks time to discuss the last werewolf by glenn duncan this was released in 2011 this is a 10 year old book about werewolves pam <laughs> so this is a book that i teach fairly often very popular with the 18 to 24 year old demographic. I teach it in my monster class. And um, it just seemed like a nice one for this. It's a seasonal novel. But I'm super curious what you guys thought of this book, because I've talked about it many times with different groups, but really only with younger people. I haven't really had the, the middle age conversation about The Last Werewolf. Wow, the, Steve, she considers us middle age. The middle age conversation. Is that wrong? We're middle well, age. We're s- all the same age, you guys. We're son, the middle part. <laughs> son, Dude. I need to tell you something. You sit down. We're going to have the middle age conversation now. About werewolves. <laughs> about werewolves. Chip, how did you feel about The Last Werewolf? What, does every um, book called The Last Werewolf come with a Barry White soundtrack? Oh, boy. So, so. <laughs> So, so tell me that that's a positive <laughs> review from Chip. Is that is that you enjoying this story, Chip? Dun dun. This is that slow piano, the build up. Dun dun dun. I'm, oh, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and take that I'm as sure a yes. Mary White is who I would go for in the soundtrack to the and, last werewolf movie. Just saying. <laughs> and that's where I ran into this book, and and. Pam, you knew by our lack of conversation over the last week that this was not a book that was really written for me. Because yes, Chip, there are adult situations in this book, and those adult situations uh, are prevalent in this book. And I found a, a disconnect between my experience and the experience of this character, Jake Marlowe, as the last werewolf, because the sexuality of this book is not the same as love. It's not the same as relationship caring. There's the, the passion is not there and the, the pleasure well, is not there. Steve, this is a werewolf. This is getting to the animal <laughs> instinct. what I wanted to say. This is, this is the animal coming out. Who's like, I must procreate or must, you know, I must take this now. This is, this is not about love. This is certainly the animal of the human nature coming out. And Steve, I'm not surprised that you and Jake Marlowe have little in common because <laughs> he's a 200 year old werewolf. I mean, <laughs> this is definitely, this is a novel where you're not connecting because you have the exact same values as the main character. Absolutely. I was gonna say as a 200 year old being a person or whatever you want to how you ever you want to describe this werewolf he's seen it he's seen it all he's seen the ebb and flow of life and he's experienced it multiple times and what what i initially got was it was very hard to create relationships where he cared Mm -hmm. because you know their life is fleeting for for us regular humans and i'm really glad you said that chip because that's one of the things that i found most fascinating right at the beginning Jake tells us, I, so he's, as a werewolf, he's a very sexual creature. So sex is a really huge part of how he communicates with people. But he says he specifically only has sex with women he dislikes, with people he dislikes. Sorry, he's not, he's not, um, he is a very, uh, he's pansexual. So he says he only has sex with women he dislikes. And we don't quite know why at the beginning, But then it turns out was we find out that the first person he killed after he was turned into a werewolf was the woman that he absolutely loved, his wife, who in fact was pregnant with their child, which he didn't know until after. But that experience, like that trauma, like (laughs) that's a pretty bad trauma of turning into a werewolf and killing the person you love the most, 
is partly why he now separates out sex from love. And I think like, yeah, that's a pretty compelling reason, right? So, I mean, we can understand where he's coming from with that. And so we know right from the start, this is not going to be a romantic story. But then Steve, as we move forward, I mean, we watch Jake fall in love. Was that compelling to you? Did that save this character in any way? No, especially (laughs) because of the format that the author has chosen to write this in a journal, past tense, first person narration, where I am reading about events that have happened in the past, and I don't have a real connection to the action that's happening. Now, there's some scenes that are very much sort of present tense where he gives us the actual events that were happening or had happened but most of it is oh and since i had some time off i decided to write in my journal and like I, okay good for you man I, I, i'm not compelled by the action of this story and i'm not compelled by this character at all can we cue the teddy pendergrass song now it's not the Teddy Pendergrass is is about love and relationship. It's not about animalistic it's, taking of another person. The, it? There's is so it, is the it? theme here. <laughs> absolutely, the theme here is our animalistic nature of humanity and and how life brings us these horrors and we have to get through them. We, there's a lot of metaphors here. The 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 metaphor of he is the last werewolf, the metaphor of he knows he's going to die and how he deals with that is is prevalent, at least in the beginning part of this book. So is it saying that the modern person is taming the animal? Dun, 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 dun. Is Thank there you. a metaphor? Is <laughs> there a metaphor here for the modern the human? Away taming that animalistic nature or breathing it out of of itself boy I, I, <laughs> okay I so don't. i'm just gonna state for the record i love this book it, and it was so funny though because i've read it a few times because i teach it regularly but as i was rereading it this week with the idea that you guys were also reading it <laughs> i was like oh, I forgot how graphic it is in both its sex and violence, which isn't it funny that I don't even worry about that when I'm setting it up for like a freshman English class (laughs) because the students are really comfortable with that, right? So I feel like we've come to such a funny point in 2021 where it's the middle-aged among us who might be like, whoa, that's a lot of sex and violence. And our students are like, "Mm mm-hmm. Um, so it was funny just having that experience where I feel like if I was a prof in the 80s, I would have been like, ooh, can I really teach this? Like, is that hmm. cool? Because it is quite graphic. Doesn't that show how young people view sexuality certainly much more um, liberal than previous generations? And think about this. The 60s, we are products of our parents in the 60s who they thought they were the uh on the forefront of sexuality and i think maybe that our generation might be reactionary against that and then the next generation some of reactionary us, against some of us. that well, yeah there's okay. a lot of variation i wouldn't <laughs> There's a certain certain group, Steve. I'll certain. just start speaking for myself, Chip. Fine. <laughs> no, no, no. But Steve, I'm glad you said that because I think there is a generational aspect to this. Um, and, and Glenn Duncan, I think, is almost the exact same age as, as the three of us. But let me ask you, one of the things I love about this novel is the writing style. I I love Jake's voice. And Steve, it sounds like you didn't. But I love that Jake has this mix of really poetic and really crass. And he also loves philosophy. So one of the questions that I always think is fascinating in this novel is the question of time. So Jake was born in the early 19th century. Um, I don't, I think we could do the math and we know what year he was turned and how old he was. So he 1810, 1820, something like that. So he's just turned, he's 200 years old. And so he and he has read through all of the enlightenment thinkers and he has seen darwin and marx 
and Freud and Nietzsche as they were new, right? And I think that one of the things that Duncan does, in my opinion, beautifully is capture what that would feel like because we have read those things, but from a late 20th or early 21st century perspective and Jake saw them new. And I think he does an amazing job with that. And the number of literary and philosophical references is just amazing. And I think that, you know, for me, English prof, I recognize lots of them, but by no means all of them, right? And then there are some that are so subtle and lovely. Like, for example, we come to the end of a section and Jake is, you know, Jake is in a box. He's been captured by woke up and they have, they have this young man there that they want him to eat so they can film the werewolf. And he really doesn't want to be filmed in his werewolf form, but the temptation is too great. You turn the page and there's the wonderful line reader. I ate him. And I don't know if you guys laughed aloud at that because that is a reference to Jane Eyre, Charlotte Bronte's lovely romance of the 19th century, where you turn the page and Jane Eyre tells you, reader, I married him. And it's like, (laughs) for this entire 500 pages, we've been thinking, Jane, don't marry Rochester. Don't do it. Don't do it. And then she gives us, and the way that Duncan does that, it's so clever and so hilarious if you know Jane Eyre. I did not understand right. that. But then, but then, Steve, Steve, you've answered that totally incorrect. Here, let's look at each other and say it. Of course, we, we got that reference. No. Of course. <laughs> of course. Rochester. <laughs> what, how could we miss that? <laughs> this is why we have Pam on the show, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like but it's very funny because even from the very first page he kind of telegraphs the kind of novel this is going to be so when when Jake you know this very like tough sexualized brawny guy who turns into a werewolf once a month and has killed however many he tells us at some point one person a, a month for the past 180 years and he has these interactions with WOCOP, which is something that I love, the World Organization for the Control of Occult Phenomenon. They tell him, Jake, we've done the research. You're the last one. You are the last werewolf. No one has been turned in 150 years. You are literally, you might be, in fact, the last person to ever be turned. And so the quote when he learns this, and he kind of knew it anyway, I'd known what he was going to tell me now that he had what vague ontological vertigo and people are like, like ontological, not really a word that we use all the time. Right. And if we do, it's in philosophy class and it's right beside epistemological is the study of knowledge. Ontological is the study of being study of being. What does that even mean? Like, what does it mean to be like, we're already, you know, it's more deep, right? So vague ontological vertigo, Kubrick's astronaut with the severed umbilicus spinning away all alone into infinity. At a certain point, one's imagination refused. And so you either love that, like me, or you're like, oh my gosh, what am I getting into? This is going to be crazy. So what I personally like and what I feel like students end up really enjoying this book is at first they think, oh, it's going to be too hard. But then it's just a story about a werewolf who knows that he's reached the end of his life and is like calm and cool and collected and is like, yeah, this is good. 200 years, plenty. And then he falls in love for the first time in 180 years and he wants to live. It's a great story. Come on. I've got a Marvin Gaye song that that comes up right (laughs) there. Jeff, you and I are not on the same page for the soundtrack of this thing. I do love all the metafiction, all of the different references to all of the different pieces of history and writing. I do love how he created all that. And but I I don't agree with you with the format. This this whole idea of 
the journal that is going back and, and describing something that happened in in memory terms. I don't like that. And he, I think, understood that. He wrote, you'll want order, sequence, categories. I sympathize. <laughs> but the trinity mystery of the, I won't say that word, collapses distinctions, swipes aside the apparatus separating this from that and introduces with the transcendental equivalent of a Gaelic shrug a completely new form of experience. I get what he's trying to do. He's trying to push me off balance with this storytelling, with no sequence, with no categories. My human brain needs categories and sequence. And by showing me what the werewolf sees, he's he's pushing my human brain off balance. I get it. Yes. Absolutely. And I actually read a few book reviews in preparation for this. Do you guys know Justin Cronin? He wrote the Passage Trilogy. No, Pam. Put Ooh. it on our book list of very, we very need to read since we've met Pam. <laughs> oh, sorry, guys. So <laughs> here's so I read this, I read this book review and I was like, oh, this is such a good book review. And it said, Steve, it said exactly what you just said. That the um he said here's what he says he says likewise the story's nominal assertion that we are in fact reading marlowe's journal doesn't wash and duncan seems to know it rarely does this largely unnecessary conceit peak above the no the book's novelistic surface and then only as a matter of transparent convenience so i mean this exact but it was so funny because when i got to the end of this review can the book be overly you know frank that depends on who you are, says Justin Cronin. Mm. Is the whole mm -hmm. thing just a little too italicized? And then in italics, he puts, yes. <laughs> and I think that's exactly right. And to my delight, I got to the bottom of this review and it was written by Justin Cronin, who I love and is one of like an author that I really, really enjoy. He's a wonderful vampire book. But, um, but I think that's exactly right. That the journal thing doesn't quite work except that it is kind of awesome when Jake's journal at the end gets picked up by another character who writes the last 20 or 30 pages. And that's pretty awesome. So I understand why Glenn Duncan did the journal, maybe hesitated about it and kept it anyway. And I do love that ending. We know that the title of this book is The Last Werewolf, and the idea of the inevitability of this character dying happens in such a wonderful way where we get the other werewolf. Spoilers, there's another werewolf in The Last <laughs> Werewolf. And she picks up where he left off in his journal and writes those pages. That That was really a surprise and a pleasant one for me. And I actually really, really enjoy book two. Oh, so the next book is Tallulah Rising, which is the story of that second werewolf. And I, I very much enjoyed both of these novels. Was there as much smoking and drinking in that one? Because boy, this one is just, they are smoking and drinking all the time in this book. More than I, I think I've ever heard described in any book before. Well, you and I may not have read all the same books, Steve. I wouldn't <laughs> really? I think you're right, Pam. <laughs> but of course, you're completely right. And Duncan actually addresses that specifically. So um, so in, in this one moment, uh, Jacqueline, who has captured Jake, says, it'll be a week before you're hungry. It's why you smoke and drink so much. The boredom of the mouth. And I think <laughs> that's kind of funny because, of course, Jake is also a big talker. Right. Mm. As are we all. And so um, there is that sense, too, that when we get later in the book, that during as you're waiting to turn into a werewolf, you have zero interest in food. And you're very I think he captures nicely. You're very frantic and you need to do something. And so smoking and drinking are the vices that the werewolf turns to as they're trying to, like, pass the time. Hmm. Sounds like uh, Hollywood, Steve. And well, yeah, that that smoking and drinking. Oh, what what what, that, do, what do they do when they're uh, in Hollywood? They uh, in smoke trailers. cigarettes and drink coffee. 
in their trailers waiting to get to set, what do you do? And and that metaphor matched with the metaphor of the werewolf being very much about the teeth, about the mouth. The werewolf is is a is a predator who is eating. That metaphor is is well placed there with that quote. And I thought that one of the real one of the really interesting ideas that goes through this is the question of time. And how much time do we want? And, you know, whenever you look at speculative fiction, whether it's sci-fi or fantasy, and this is kind of a, a very specific type of monster literature that's in the fantasy realm at the edge of it, you do have that question of the desire for more time that a lot of us have. And I guess this is one of the reasons that I specifically mentioned our own ages, our own like middle age perspective as literary critics is you know, Jake says again and again and again that 200 years in, he is so bored of the world. And I've got to tell you, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, there's so much to read. Like I'm getting to the point now where I sometimes see a book and I think, ooh, do, will I have time to read that in my lifetime? There's so many books I still want to read and I have to be realistic about how much time I have. And so personally, as a reader, as someone who loves to play games and like to, to like do fun entertainment activities, I feel like I could do 200 years, no problem. I don't think I would be bored at the end of 200 years, you know? So Time enough at last. Just, just be in the vault when the bomb goes off and hopefully your glasses won't break. Well, <laughs> exactly. Steve, you almost think it's like a Twilight Zone episode. <laughs> That would make a really good Twilight Zone episode. Pam finally gets enough time to read all those books. But but the, the, the tragedy is that she breaks the, her no, glasses. No, the <laughs> end. That's all. That's all there is to it. <laughs> she just gets and if she all only looked like Burgess Meredith, Steve, I, mean, <laughs> I don't want Pam to look like Burgess Meredith. <laughs> My glasses aren't that thick. I can read glasses. <laughs> oh, they're pretty close, though. They're getting worse. But anyway, <laughs> I am definitely becoming the person who's not sure whether to take the glasses off or put the glasses on to read the menu. But anyway, we won't go there today. So, but let me ask you guys, is that notion that like 200 years in, you'd be so jaded, you'd be ready for death? Does that did that strike you as realistic or not? And I'll read you a quick quote. Naturally, one sets oneself challenges. Sanskrit, Kant, advanced calculus. <clears throat> I'm not sure that would be mine. Tai Chi. But that only addresses the problem of time. The bigger problem of being just keeps getting bigger. So this notion of like, should you even exist is if you're in an unnatural state of werewolf, like, can you accept that? And he has struggles with accepting his role in nature as this predator. He he does not enjoy this predator nature, and, and he's bored with the world. He's been there, done that. Can you imagine how many of those things are cyclical? How many of those things keep coming around? And once again, we have bell-bottoms. I'm waiting for bell-bottoms to come back around, by the way. And... <laughs> And how many times the same stories are told? We see this in fiction and in movies so often. I can imagine being bored with the world after 200 years. Well, what about you, Chip? I, I think you, you, you've missed the point. Now, he may be bored with it, but you know, it's, it could be that it's where his mind is at this point. Because assuming you have health, Assuming you have the ability to change yourself uh, and transform, you know, you could live different lifetimes. And there's one of the real challenges with getting older is that you realize that maybe you, you can't live another lifetime because your health is not there or something of that nature. But for a person who, you know, they're a college professor for a while and then they decide they're going to go and... I don't know, be a, a person who works on a ship for a while, and then they do that, and then they go and, uh, I don't know, become a farmer for a while. You know, the idea of reinventing yourself uh, as an immortal, I mean, it, it could be fulfilling, 
But if you are a person who is stuck in a position and, and unable to move forward, you can see that that's one of the challenges of living in COVID times is hmm. people may not feel, you know, there are some people who are taking this time to re to change themselves. And there are other people who are just waiting, waiting around. It's kind of the state of mind. I, I think there may be the point of that is, our, you know, Shawshank Redemption, get busy living or get busy dying. That's such a great insight, Chip. I like, it's funny because when I was rereading it, I thought this is the perfect book for to read during COVID. And then I didn't quite know why. And you just articulated it because we do have that feeling exactly of like, how do you deal with time and with being? And there's two approaches. And you guys, like, I don't know how often, at least once a week, I think, oh, I wish I could do a PhD in X. Like, in economics, in history, in French, in music. And I just don't have time. And just what you just said, Chip, like it would be amazing. I would love to choose a completely different profession, start at the beginning and learn all of the things for that profession. But of course I don't, I don't have time. And so it's interesting, those, those approaches. And he provides in the novel that Jake's wife, who he desperately loved and killed, had once said that, oh, I love so many things, conversation and nature and food and sex, and then, quote, and an occasional glimpse of my own death to keep me mindful of the beauty and preciousness of life. And so Duncan is suggesting, or at least his character, Jake, is suggesting that if you don't have that idea of death, you wouldn't appreciate all the things. So my dream of doing PhDs in like eight different things that only exists because of death. Then, of course, it's such a fascinating idea because we have no way of testing it. <laughs> we can't put people in two different immortal control, a control group and a test group and see what happens because, of course, we all do have death. And so speculative fiction is a way to think that through. It's such a fascinating idea. That's why we have the multiverse. Um, you can live a thousand right. different lifetimes. And and coming soon, the metaverse that Facebook is building for us. So we've got that going for us. <laughs> Good point, Steve. <laughs> Whoo, boy. We could, we could think through what it would be like to be in the singularity, being a mind in a computer, being immortal. The chances of that happening technologically are distinct. We possibly could get to that point. And what are the ramifications of all of that thinking? Death is is a, an important part of life. And to me, that's only one of the numerous really I'm, deep thoughts. I, I'm sorry. I was supposed to do this really... Whoa. Thank you. <laughs> that, that's what happens when I say the singularity. <laughs> of course. Forgive me. I should have known this by now. I've known you guys long enough. <laughs> now, Steve, you already mentioned this, but I want to pop back to the idea that Duncan is really enthusiastic, as the three of us are, about the power of story. Right. And so he says in the post everything world, it turns out humans can't kick the story habit. Homer gets the last laugh. So even after we don't believe in like God is dead, science is dead, spirituality is dead. You still love the story. Mm -hmm. And of course, as an English professor, like that's exactly, you know, the, that is my core belief as well. That story is one of the most important things we have. It's what makes us human. And maybe it even transfers to werewolves. And as a Buffy fan, you uh. love the, the the idea of the metafiction of having Buffy the Vampire Slayer quote in this book, right? And Buffy appears many times in this book, not just <laughs> once, my friend. <laughs> so, <laughs> I heard so, it was a very popular series at one time. Hmm, yes, it, it might be even a transformative series in both fan and in fandom in how fan fiction, I mean, it was a huge, huge huge space for fan fiction mm -hmm. but also for girl power grrl i mean this is a this is a huge series and i think jacob marlowe and i read and watch many of the same things which was a pleasure for me 
Um, <laughs> you guys do know that there's an academic journal, Slayage, that is devoted to Buffy studies. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Just oh, yes. I'm sure you knew that. <laughs> I think I think our smart professor friend from Connecticut has told us that before. <laughs> I think I think that that we know Buffy was a, certainly a a one moment in fiction that has transcended into all of these other pieces of of fiction. I I hear about Buffy the Vampire Slayer from so many different people, and it's interesting to see that metafiction in this one as well. And it's twenty years old now too, and it still pops up. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and we also one of the things I really enjoy is how he plays with the idea that this book is going to get taught in college classrooms. So even as, even within the novel, there comes a moment when Jake is chatting with Jacqueline and discussing the meaning of the werewolf. And Jacqueline says, werewolves are not a subject for academe, but you know what the professors would be saying if they were. Monsters die out when the collective imagination no longer needs them. And I'm just like, oh man, like I always say that, right? <laughs> Of course, I totally teach this in my college classroom, and so do many other professors. And, you know, I have an essay in a collection called Teaching Monster Lit. Like, this is an actual thing. And so then Jake responds, yes, I keep telling myself I'm just an outmoded idea. But, you know, you find yourself ripping a child open and swallowing its heart. It's tough not to be overwhelmed by the concrete reality of yourself. And I just love that. It's like... Sure. You know, you have these professors saying the werewolf is is an idea that completely captures some of the anxieties of our moment, anxieties about time and being, about temporality and ontology. Like I have given that lecture. <laughs> but then as a werewolf, just seems like you're eating a lot of kids and they're pretty <laughs> tasty. You know, it's just really <laughs> the, just the, the humor of that is just delightful. The juxtaposition. There, there's quite a few it moments is. in this book where the juxtaposition is is just striking, and he he does that so well. the The idea of the werewolf being studied. I I gotta tell you, Pam, werewolves are not on my list of the monsters that I study a lot. I don't know that. I've read another werewolf book other than this one. And you guys, isn't that interesting? Because mm -hmm. when, when I put together a monster lit syllabus, I have so many options for vampire. Oh boy, which vampire story am I going to teach? And I even have a whole vampire class. I wouldn't even be able to populate a, well, I would, but just barely able to populate a werewolf class. And I've mm. never taught one, but so the vampire and literature culture class, you, you still have to make a lot of decisions. For zombies, you have a lot of decisions to make. There are lots of great zombie stories. I always have a serial killer unit. And obviously that's the one where you just go all over the place. But in the monster and lit class, this is the only werewolf novel I teach. And I always, this is always the werewolf novel I teach because it's really the one. And I am kind of curious about like why the werewolf doesn't have the same cultural currency as those other monsters, the sci-fi monster, the serial killer, the zombie, the vampire. You'll have to Google this, but there is a, a theory out there between zombies and vampires on which political party is in power and which <laughs> genre is, is uh, uh -huh. the prevalent one. And I don't think that uh, werewolves uh, have entered that. They're just Third being party. crowded out. It's a third party problem. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it goes back to language. I, I don't know that we have the language of the animal because werewolves can't speak. We don't get. We can't. They, they don't have a voice, Dave. Yeah, they don't have a I, voice. They need someone party. like you. Third party, for sure. Ross Perot, werewolf. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, that's one of the reasons that I was really excited to read this with you guys. As we approach Halloween, I think it's really typical to read Dracula, to read Frankenstein, to watch The Walking Dead, you know, as we're thinking, oh, it's Halloween time. But I wanted to bring you something the the overlooked monster who I think still has tons and tons of potential. And to me, 
I completely take the critiques of the novel, but I still think it's a really fun one that does go pretty deep into a lot of really interesting to discuss philosophical questions. A good time to right. end with an Al Green song, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Some hip hop on this soundtrack. <laughs> like, seriously. <laughs> but we do get some vampires in this story. So so there is some vampire talk. There's no uh, bringing people back from the dead Frankenstein creature talk that I recall, right? I think it just mentioned Frankenstein is mentioned a couple times, but just in passing. Um, like just the the literature of Frankenstein, exactly. not like That's an right. actual character. Right. But there are vampires in this one, and these vampires are really different from the vampires that we might be more used to in Buffy. These vampires cannot have sex, and that's hmm. one of the big differences between Duncan's werewolf and vampire. And of course, they can't go out in the day, and they're desperately trying to figure out a way for to to transform themselves so that they can actually exist in the daytime. And these vampires really think they're superior to werewolves because they have language and civility, whereas mm -hmm. werewolves are just animalistic. And that's so interesting that in most vampire literature, sex is a big part of that yeah. conversation. It might actually be, the, the, the vampire itself might actually just be a metaphor for sex and and transmission and and all sorts of you know hypnosis and and, and mind games and there's, there's all sorts of things the vampire seduction. is seductive yeah. blah blah, right. blah blah i don't say blah 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 <laughs> So I think we need to give equal time here to uh, our vampire friends, Pam. <laughs> I mean, you, you'll you never get disagreement from me that if we talk about werewolves, we should follow it up with vampires. So do you have a vampire book for us to of read? Of course I do. Now, <laughs> with the vampire, okay, we have a lot of classic vampire stories. But I would love to go to a lesser known, but I think equally important vampire story. Would you guys read Octavia Butler's Fledgling with me? Pam, yes. you have been asking us to read Octavia Butler for years now. And we, we keep going, yeah, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. We'll get to it. This is one of those stories that we said that we're going to get to. It's time to get to it. Let's read Fledgling by Octavia Butler. This was published in 2005, and it just happens to be her final novel. She passed away after the publication, and it's a vampire story. It's killing two birds with one stone or three bats. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, you guys. I would love to hear what you think of this novel. Yep, you can read it along with us. We're going to read Fledgling by Octavia Butler. Find a copy and read along with us. We're going to talk about it next week. We're going to cheat. We're going to cheat and do two weeks in a row with Pam because it's Halloween and we can get through all the monsters that she teaches in her monster class. God, I would love to take that monster class, Pam. I'm going. I'm packing the car and coming to, to <laughs> Connecticut. I would love to take that monster class. That sounds wonderful. Chip, any final thoughts on the werewolves? Uh, it was enjoyable. Thank you for recommending it. Thanks for reading with me. That was The Last Werewolf by Glenn Duncan, 2011. Uh, you, you can read it. Scroll with it. Brings us to our scroll with it. It is Halloween, Chip. I'm so excited for this weekend. It's going to be so much fun. But we have to remember that that there's there's real stories behind Halloween, and there's the, there's some real sadness in the news this week. Well, with every life, there there is passing, um, and some people think that's a blessing uh, because many times your bad ideas get to pass with you. But we had some uh, individuals of note that passed away this last week. We had Colin Powell, who passed away, and uh, he was uh, Secretary of State for a number of times. And Steve, you've got one of your favorite actors. Yeah, Peter Scolari, unfortunately, passed away this week. One of my favorite memories of childhood was a silly little sitcom called Bosom Buddies, where Peter Scolari and this other actor, his name was Tom 
Hanks, was that his name? The two of them pretended to be women to live in a women's apartment complex, which was ridiculous and sitcom-y, very 80s. I, I'm, I'll miss Peter Scolari for sure. And Stapley should be very, very happy because 95-year-old Mel Brooks is still living, and that means he can still produce fun things. I'm so excited to hear about... Finally, we are going to get History of the World Part 2 from the mind of Mel Brooks. 95-year-old Mel Brooks is finally making History of the World Part 2 40 years after History of the World Part 1 promised us Jews in space. I, I look forward to... This. It's going to be a series on Hulu, but I don't think that's going to change the comedy of it. I have high expectations for History of the World Part 2. I don't know, Chip. I think we have enough information to survive another week. What do you think? Only if we can come back next week, Steve. Pam, do you, do you think we you can come back next week and, yes. and, and talk to us about vampires? <laughs> yes, I do. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for bringing us the werewolf book this week and, and coming back next week for the vampire book. Equal time. That's important. We would love to hear from you. Give us a call or a text. Our phone number is 805-4104-TMS. Our website is TooMuchScrolling.com. Our email is TooMuchScrolling at gmail.com. We're on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. We're on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and YouTube. And you can always ask your smart speaker to play the latest episode of Too Much Scrolling. I want to thank you again for listening to Too Much Scrolling. I'm Steve Fodor. And I'm Spooky Chip Essenflow. And I'm Pam Vidor. We'll see you in the future. Woo!